Good morning and good afternoon. It's great to see how that we have so many participants joining this webinar called Step by Step, the HIG FEM Verification Trail Section 5, Wastewater. We from Leadership and Sustainability are looking forward to spending the next hour with you. And this is the fourth in a series of webinars where we will take you into depth um, into the different sections of the HIG FEM, the Facility Environmental Module. So my name is Karen Ekberg and I'm the founder and manager of the consulting company Leadership and Sustainability. I have spent nearly 35 years in the sustainability area, worked in many different sectors, and since more than 10 years now, I'm working in the textile sector. And before I started my own company, I worked several years at Adidas. I was responsible for environment globally and um, uh, setting the goals and the strategy uh, for environment. And this role included developing the environmental strategy for the supply chain as well, together with our business functions and regional representatives. So let's begin. We will introduce you today to the SAC HIG FEM Facility Environmental Module with the section uh, five, wastewater. And as I mentioned, we will have time for your questions. And finally, we will also make an offer and present our team to you, our growing team. Let me introduce you to the verification trail and the purpose of the verification trail. The purpose of this trail is to give you a better and deeper understanding of the HIG FEM. And we will take you through the HIG FEM section by section and make you acquainted with all requirements um, in the how to HIG and uh, in the HIG FEM. But before we continue on our trail, I would like to give you an overview of the self-assessment and verification process. So we have identified seven simple steps. You complete your self-assessment uh, for the FEM and this is where our webinar series strives to support you in how to best complete your self-assessment and thereby also preparing yourself for a verification if you are deciding to go for a verification. Then if you do that, you need to engage a verifier and pro provide information on the type of factory you have, number of employees, etc. And um, you then make the self-assessment available to the verifier. The verifier will review the self-assessment, the documents uh, before the actual verification and send you an agenda as well ahead on, of the on-site visit. And then during the on-site visit, you go through the questions together, uh, probably online, and you also look at all the documents that you have. And finally, you will have a report in some, in some format. Uh, so we usually produce a PowerPoint report at the end of our verifications. And there is also from SAC, there is an on-site verification guideline. And you can see the link down at this slide. So when you get to the slide deck, you can click on that link and find the uh, information about uh, the process of the uh, on-site verification. For all of you who are doing your self-assessment or preparing to get verified, and I realize that some of you have already completed the self-assessment perhaps even once before or perhaps even twice before. But anyway, here is some general advice for how you can uh, prepare and conduct your, do your self-assessment. You do need to appoint a person who is responsible who coordinates the and actual exercise and the um, filling in the HIG FAM self-assessments. You should read the how to HIG guidance and the verification preparation guidance as well. There is a wealth of information online available in the how to HIG uh, documents. And uh, it's really valuable to read and have a look at this documentation. Uh, before you begin with the self-assessment, but of course also during um, the completion of the self-assessment. And then, and um, I cannot stress this enough, it is really important that you respond accurately to the question. So do your best to understand the questions and what is the meaning of the questions, and then also document uh, your responses well. 
uh, we often see during verifications that perhaps the wrong documents have been uploaded or they have been uploaded than where they actually belong. And um, this um, makes it more difficult to do the verification, but it actually may mean that you may lose some of the results that you would like to have. Uh, so please take some time to do that um, rigorously. There have sometimes also been uh, problems with the platform in terms of downloading those documents. So um, I suggest to you that you build a folder on your own computer where you post all the documents as well, sorted to the different sections and the different questions so that you have them really readily available. All right. And then uh, let's get back to our trail. This is the overview of all the sections that are included in the FEM model, module. And today we will move on to the section five, the wastewater section. And in the wastewater section, first, we do have a few applicability questions. And you know, the applicability questions, they are there in order to understand what type of facility you have. So in some of the sections in the HIGFEM, you have those applicability questions and they help uh, the system to, uh, to understand what type of facility you have and then accordingly give you the questions that you should be responding to. So obviously this is really, really important. Um, in the water section, for example, there is a question um, about uh, risk uh, if you are in a in a water scarcity risk zone, and um, and here in this case with the wastewater, there are uh, questions related to uh, if you generate industrial wastewater, uh, if you generate also uh, domestic wastewater, and how you treat them. Then also, do you have uh, a zero liquid discharge plant? And we see sometimes that some facilities respond yes here, although you may not have a zero liquid discharge um, plant actually. And so um, please read up on this in the how to HIG and make sure that you respond correctly here. So zero liquid discharge, that is a water treatment process in which the entire stream of the wastewater is purified and actually recycled. So at the end of the process, you have no wastewater leaving the plant. Uh, or you have a very, very concentrated brine. That might be a possibility that as well, that you have a very, very concentrated brine from the, uh, from the recycling process. And then also, do you treat industrial and domestic wastewater together? together? Uh, and where is the individual or combined wastewater treated on site, off site, or with a septic tank? So there are several questions um, here for the applicability. And it's, as, as I said, it's really important to uh, respond to them correctly because the following questions are lined up accordingly, according to your responses here. And now let us get an overview of all the questions that we have uh, in this section. So you see there are several questions at level one, two questions at level three, and only one question at level three, uh, sorry, two questions at level two, and just one question at level three. And uh, remember how the scores um, are, or how the points are distributed uh, over the levels. So you have at level one, you have 25 points possible. At level two, you have 50 points. And at level three, you have uh, 25 points. Sometimes depending on the applicability, uh, the there may be some questions that you will not get, so to say, that will be removed from your set of questions. And then the, the points may be distributed a bit uh, differently. But this is now the overview for the wastewater section. So several questions already at level one. And, and now we will go through those questions one by one. And the first question is, does your facility track its wastewater volume? 
So we actually see that there are quite a lot of fact, uh, factories that do not do this. You may be tracking your incoming water into the factory, but you are not um, you are not measuring your wastewater volume. But here, uh, this question is about doing that. So the question is, what was the total quantity of wastewater discharge from your facility uh, in 2019 now, when you are completing the self-assessment now? And then also, which method was used to track wastewater volume? So in some cases, there is, are only estimations. And of course, estimations of the wastewater volumes are not uh, that accurate as, a, as an actual measurement. And then what is the frequency of measurement? Do you have a continuous measurement? Um, um, or are you just reading uh, uh, day, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, or on a monthly, monthly basis, for example? And then also, what was the final discharge point for your facility's wastewater? And here, we suggest that you upload your annual wastewater discharge monitoring record. And uh, regarding tracking wa uh, water and wastewater sources, so of course you know that if you want to manage and improve your performance, uh, reduce your wastewater flows, um, for example, then you also need to have KPIs. So essentially, we need to track how much uh, we how much wastewater we have. And how are we going to do that? Well, very simple, uh, with flow meters. And there are different types of flow meters. So we have, for example, mechanical flow meters. They are the most common and economical type of water flow meters. And they perform flow measurement through turbine rotation um, and, um, and Possibly, depending on the type of wastewater you have, they may not be suitable really for wastewater. Um, then we have vortex meters. We ha also have ultrasonic water flow meters. Uh, if we have large uh, pipes, um, we also have magnetic flow meters. They measure, the they measure the speed of a fluid passing through a pipe using a magnetic field to measure the volumetric flow. They cannot measure pure water as there are no ions to measure. But of course, wastewater uh, should be possible. And so, of course, the best type of uh, flow meter, it depends on the specific application. Um, and uh, then the next question, and that is the question, do you have the name and contact information of the off-site wastewater treatment plant? So uh, why is this important? Well, um, SAC um, decided very early on that they consider it very important for you as a facility to not only take responsibility for what are, you are doing on site, but also to take responsibility for what is happening of your different discharges and emissions. So in this case, um, the reason is uh, you that you should have the contact information is that you actually also contact the off-site wastewater treatment plant and ask them about their um, treatment results. And I realize uh, that this is a question that is a bit uncommon um, uh, to ask, especially if you have a municipal wastewater treatment plant um, and not a private owner. Uh, it's uh, a bit interesting to ask uh, the authorities basically for their uh, treatment results. But usually you can do that and you are credited for asking. So even if you wouldn't get any response, you do get credit just for asking. So you should know the name, the address, the ownership. You should also have a copy of course of your contract with the wastewater treatment plant. And it would be great if you could upload this uh, contract as well. Uh, then if you get the result, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, but uh, you don't get penalized if you don't. What is important is that you, um, that you ask them for their results. OK, and then question number three. Does your facility have a backup plan if there is an emergency situation related to wastewater? 
And this is also a question where we see that uh, some facilities don't really fulfill this, uh, fulfill this requirement. And so the intention is that you have a backup plan and installations to be ta able to take care of the wastewater if you cannot discharge it into the drainage, into the canalization. So, uh, for example, um, a possible backup plan could be to have an emergency production shutdown, which is, of course, um, not uh, what you would like to see. So you should have other backup plans. And one very common one is to have a holding tank. And uh, so here, um, SAC and the HIGFM is then also asking, what is the size of your facility's holding tank? Do you have any other secondary treatment or do you have um, an other discharge that you can do to an offsite wastewater treatment plant if your own is not working, for example, or do you have any other backup process? And you should then uh, please upload accordingly um, the documents you have available. And then the next question is hazardous sludge disposed of properly? Depending on the quality of your waste, the wastewater you ha have, in most cases, your sludge from the wastewater treatment plant will be hazardous, especially if you are treating industrial wastewater. If you are treating only domestic wastewater, uh, it may be that your sludge is not um, uh, hazardous. And this also may depend on your local legislation. So in some countries, um, all sludges are de deemed to be non-hazardous. Uh, and in many countries, you have different, depending, uh, different types of sludges according to legislation, depending on if you have um, a domestic wastewater treatment plant or an industrial or a combined one. And then, so uh, you need to have a proper hazardous waste treatment. Um, the sludge may be incinerated. It may be landfilled. Um, open burning is, of course, not allowed um, in, um, uh, in your facility at all of any type of waste. Uh, it may also be blended into fuel in some countries, um, for example, hazardous sludge or other hazardous waste categories are incinerated in cement kilns, for example. Uh, composted, if the sludge is hazardous, it should not be composted and it should also not be used as a fertilizer applied to, to land. But those are the current um, options that you have uh, when you respond. And then, of course, the suggested upload is a permit or a manifest for proper disposal. And uh, how do you now decide if your sludge is hazardous or not? Well, first of all, you need to look at the legislation and uh, the definition of hazardous sludge according to your local um, legislation. But then there are, for example, a test that can be done. Um, it's the TCLP, the Toxicity Characteristics Leaching Procedures um, that you can use. And so it's, you need a lab in order to do that. Uh, you check the leachate and the heavy, heavy metals amount in the sludge. And of course, you may have other toxic substances than just heavy metals. You may have um, uh, uh, pesticides, for example. You may have organic, um, organic compounds that are toxic as well. And so, of course, also by using safer chemicals and decreased chemicals usage in your production, your sludge um, may be, uh, become non-hazardous. And if it is uh, hazardous, yeah, we have the similar treatment um, options that we already talked about, sludge treatment um, in special uh, treatment plants for toxic sludge. Energy recovery um, is also a possibility in uh, cement factories as a fuel and uh, then incineration. So in many countries as well, uh, all toxic waste is incinerated. In other countries, 
uh, toxic waste is still being landfilled, although that is actually not the, the best way to take care of um, hazardous waste. All right, uh, you may also have a non-hazardous sludge from your wastewater, and that is what the question five is asking about. Option, you may have incineration, you may have landfilling, you may have open burning, and again, on your facility site, open burning is not allowed, uh, according to the HIG FEM. You may blend it into fuel again. You may have composting. Um, uh, you may use it as a compost, compost, and also as a fertilizer. And you should uh, upload the sludge analysis or test results, and also any permits uh, that you that you have in place. Then in some cases, um, especially at smaller facilities, you may have a septic uh, tank to treat your domestic wastewater. And that is what question six is asking you about. So if you have answered in, your, in the applicability questions that you have a septic wastewater treatment um, tank, then this question will show up for you. And the question is, does your facility treat the septic wastewater before it is discharged? So how does your site unload your septic tank once it is full? Uh, do you have an external service provider who comes and empties it for you? Uh, or how do you, or are, this, are you discharging uh, the wastewater in some way um, uh, locally? So you need to describe where it is discharged, how it is treated also after the discharge, and also, of course, um, upload the corresponding uh, documentation. Then here there is also a question uh, related to an upgrade. So septic tank treatment um, is not seen as the most uh, effective wastewater treatment. Um, so the question uh, from HIGFEM is, do you have a plan to upgrade? to a mod more modern wastewater treatment approach. And this is a question, of course, that is very much linked to your local legislation. So if your local legislation and authorities, if they uh, agree that you can still keep your septic tank, then it may be very difficult for you to, uh, to argue that you should uh, install a more modern wastewater treatment approach that may be much more costly. Um, but it may still be something that you can consider. And uh, just about the septic water treatment, I wanted to show you this uh, slide as well. So you may use a septic tank if you don't have any other sewage treatment uh, system, but it should be designed accordingly to your BUD load, and so to your biological oxygen demand uh, load, and it may not be feasible for very large facilities. So typical septic tank removal efficiencies are 40% BOD, biological oxygen demand. So only 40%, 70% uh, percent, um, of total solids, and 77% of fats, oil, and grease. So the removal rate, um, sorry, so the removal rate is not really very great. And uh, so that's uh, the reason why it's not, uh, why it's not that um, uh, the most optimum way to treat your domestic wastewater. And here you can see also uh, in this illustration that sometimes you have, uh, you, you may not have an external service provider who comes and empties the septic tank for you, uh, but you may have an infiltration uh, installation here where you, in, where you basically discharge the treated uh, domestic wastewater into the soil uh, here. All right, then the next question uh, at level two now, and this is about uh, are you reporting against the wastewater standard? So very commonly used uh, wastewater standards is the set dhc the Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals, and it's wastewater guideline. Many of your uh, buyers may be asking you to, uh, to report uh, according to the set dhc wastewater guideline, but there is also from uh, BSR, uh, there is uh, are also from IPE, if you are based in China. 
and you may have other from your customers and from the brands you may have other requirements as well and of course uh, you probably always have your local legislation too and of course you need to accordingly test and meet all parameters specified in the standard and um, and in the HIG FEM, you may get credited if you reach certain uh, better levels, for example, in the SETI-HCE, in the Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals Wastewater Guideline. And so uh, there is also a question, um, a follow-up question in within the question seven, are your parameter results available on the standards platform? So this doesn't mean that you have done the analysis and send it to your local authorities. Here, the question is really about, are your results uploaded somewhere on the standards platform? Like, for example, the SETI-HC platform, where you can upload the, the results so that they are also available. <clears throat> and uh, also, if you, have, if you are using the SETI-HC wastewater guideline, uh, are your test results, do they also show no detection of the of different parameters mentioned in the different um, uh, limit uh, tables with the limits uh, within that uh, guideline? So again, you need to upload the documentation, the wastewater test report, and potentially, for example, a picture of the SETI-HC gateway. That's the name of the platform that SETI-HC is using. Um, so, so that we can uh, see that. And now uh, I would like just to give you some more background information about the SETI-HC, uh, the Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals program. So in 2011, uh, Greenpeace launched the detox campaign. They collected actually many samples from well-known brands and their suppliers discharge points, among others in China. And uh, they measured uh, the uh, pollutant, the levels of pollutants in the discharges. And then they made a, a report about that. And uh, they basically showed that the wastewater limits were not always met and that there were several um, hazardous chemicals um, present in the wastewater, even though they were not always above the limits. And uh, they put a lot of pressures then on many brands and asked the brands to basically commit to eliminate 11 priority hazardous chemicals and decrease the discharge of general effluent parameters. So uh, this was the starting point. And with the detox campaign of Greenpeace, as, um, as a response to that, the zero discharge of hazardous chemicals um, program was actually launched and started and it's still alive uh, today. It is, has grown into quite a large organization based in Amsterdam. And uh, I actually had the pleasure to um, be a founding member when at the time when I was at Adidas of the Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals program. So um, that is also the SETI-HC, the MRSL we have as well. It's not the wastewater standard, but it's connected to that, the Manufacturing Restricted Substances list. And that is a list that uh, clarifies which chemicals you are allowed to use in your manufacturing if you are committing yourselves to the SETI-HC MRSL. Um, so this is not about the final product. There we use the concept of RSL, Restricted Substances List. But this is the concept of making sure that the production itself, the manufacturing and the chemicals used in the manufacturing are restricted. And of course, there is a reason for that because uh, the RSLs, they point to the end product, making sure that there are no harmful chemicals on the final product. But in the production, in the manufacturing, you may be using chemicals that may be reacting during the processes, in the dyeing process, for example, in the finishing process, and may not be ending up, so to say, uh, uh, on the end product, but they may still be harmful in production. 
for the workers, but also uh, for the environment via air emissions or wastewater discharge. So that's why, um, why the concept of the MRSL was, um, was um, implemented. And yes, again, coming back to the SETDSC wastewater standards, they actually have some sampling deadlines uh, for that work. Uh, twice a year, usually they take their samples. All right, and now coming back again to your external wastewater treatment plan. So remember, we had the question about having the address, et cetera, of the offsite wastewater treatment plant. And here we are now asking about uh, have you also requested wastewater quality test results uh, from that plant? So you do need, um, if you want to score here, you do need to show that you have actually asked them. So if it was via an email or via a more formal letter, uh, you should also upload this letter. And of course, if you have a response, if you have received quality results, from the wastewater treatment plants, you should also upload that. And then uh, regarding your indirect discharge, you should, uh, as we said already, request the wastewater quality results. Uh, you should look at the quality rec records and have a look, and you may even make a, an on-site visit. And um, when we go into the section on waste, you will also see there are questions there related to um, making on-site visits to uh, the places, the, uh, the installations where the waste is treated, especially the hazardous waste. And this is a similar question uh, related to that. All right, and now we have come to the final question. Uh, and this is the, the only question at level three, question eight. Does your facility reuse and or recycle process wastewater as a process water? Do, so do you have a like a closed loop system? And here you do need to upload the documentation, etc., and explain how your uh, recycling process is, um, is uh, organized and is structured. And um, you, in order to score well here, you actually need to recycle 80% or more of your total uh, uh, wastewater. Uh, the total wastewater output that you have, you need to recycle at least 80% of it or more in order to get full points here. So this is a very challenging question and not many, not many facilities yet um, can reach this. And if you uh, can recycle 50 to 79%, then you get partial points. Um, and finally, if you recycle perhaps 25%, so less than 49%, then you actually don't get any points at all. Um, and if you are not aware, uh, if you are recycling, but mostly you actually are aware if you are or not, then you get uh, zero points. So um, in a world where fresh water is an increasingly valuable resource, industrial processes threaten its availability on two fronts unless the water is treated and recycled. Many industrial processes require water and then reduce the availability of water for the environment or other processes, or alternatively contaminate and release water that actually uh, damages or pollutes the local environment. So therefore, zero liquid discharge is a water treatment process in which all wastewater is recycled and purified, therefore leaving zero liquid discharge at the end of the treatment cycle. So it's a um, very advanced wastewater treatment method that includes ultrafiltration, uh, reverse osmosis, potentially evaporation, crystallization, and, and other methods as well. And um, it's um, a process also that in some countries, for example, in some regions in India, have been made mandatory by the local authorities. So the, the benefits are that you have lowered wastewater volumes and also you can decrease the cost associated with the wastewater with the wastewater treatment. But obviously, 
to build this recycling plant um, also costs uh, cost a significant amount of, of uh, money. So um, that can uh, that is a could be a really good benefit. What I wanted to say here as well is that I do think that um, the set, uh, zero liquid is charged uh, process is a really great treatment, but you also need to consider that at the end you do have a brine, a highly concentrated brine or a salt, for example, and currently there are no um, good uh, treatment methods for this type. So it's basically also waste and most of the time it is a hazardous waste that you have at the, at the end of the process. And here you see also the, a very, very simplified uh, flow scheme uh, of the set, uh, zero liquid discharge uh, process. So you do have the wastewater treatment, your, your so-called for this process of pretreatment, and then usually you have a membrane treatment. You may have an ultrafiltration and then reverse osmosis. Um, you may even have an evaporator. Uh, or you take just the brine then afterwards. So this was um, uh, some more details about the zero liquid discharge um, approach. And with that, we have actually covered all questions in the wastewater section. And now I would like to move over and see if we have any questions from you in the audience. So let me have a look here. Okay, I have one question here. Um, is the HIG index under upgrading in this period? I find a total different frame in the website and it's not possible to see the past module I inputted in. So I do not find the questions you are explaining. Hmm. Uh, there have been some changes to the, um, uh, to the, uh, to the layout of the site, but it shouldn't look very much differently and last time I was logged in I, I couldn't see a lot any differences and it should be possible for you to see the past module. If you have any technical problems with the platform I would suggest that you use the, the question button and uh, when you are logged in you can see at the top uh, a bit on the right hand side there should be a question mark you click on there and you can send um, a support question. Yeah. All right, great. <laughs> Please do that, great. Any other questions or comments? Let me see. Yes. So that means, here we have one question. So that means 80% or above recycled water required to get the full points. If the brands have communicated to suppliers that they should install a reverse osmosis plant, um, I don't know of any brand that has communicated that specifically. Uh, so it is uh, very different uh, from brand to brand, exactly which requirements related to the HIG FEM that they have. Um, I, so I don't know about this. Uh, but also remember, this is the last question in that section. So this is the only level three question. So which means that um, if you have full scores on all other questions, you should already have 75%. And so this question then would cover the final uh, 25 points. Uh, yeah. So it, it's, as I said, I, I don't know uh, exactly what the brands are asking of you. Any other questions? There is a question here. What is the difference between the set DHC portal and gateway? So get the gateway is where uh, all results are uploaded and the portal, I, uh, it may be just the general set DHC website. Um, any other questions? Hmm. No. All right. But uh, please feel free to send in your questions uh, to us uh, separately if you have any. Here is a question. If factory have only STP, any need to upload set DHC test report? I'm not sure I, I am clear on this question. Could you explain a bit more what you mean by this question? 
So um, the requirement regarding SETDHC, that's not a formal requirement or a legal requirement. This depends on uh, the brands and the buyers you have. You may have brands buying from you that have asked you to follow the SETDHC wastewater guideline and to upload the reports accordingly. But if you don't have that, then it's not a requirement uh, to do that. Yeah? All right, great. Thanks for the questions. And then we will uh, continue. So um, I also want to give you some more information about our offers. Um, so we offer training and verification in many countries and we have been verifying in several of the countries listed here, uh, probably in at least uh, 20 different countries. We have local verifiers also in several countries. Uh, so for example, in, we have in Bangladesh, we have in Turkey, we have here in Germany, we have in Tunisia, and we are also uh, soon having more verifiers, for example, also in China. So we can um, support you in many places of the world with trainings and also with verifications. And I also want to encourage you uh, to begin to plan your verifications quite early. In our experience now, um, over the two past years, uh, 2018 and 2019, that was that we got a lot of requests towards the end of the year in September, October, November, and even mid-December for on-site verifications. And um, uh, it is very difficult to plan um, uh, to plan on such a short notice. And then the calendars are mostly quite full as well. So it would be really helpful if you could, um, if you could uh, seek to plan as early as possible if you want to do a verification. And also please be aware that in order to do a verification uh, with a third party uh, verifier, you need to also buy a separate module. So if you have the FEM, that is for your self-assessment. In order to do the verification, you also need to buy the VFEM. That's a separate module. Some of you may already have bought it as a package, uh, but if you haven't, please consider this as well. And also, uh, please mark it up in your calendar. You can only buy the VFEMs until uh, the last day of October, until the 31st of October. After that, in November and December, you cannot buy the VFEM. You can still do the verification until the end of the year, but you cannot buy the VFEM. And we had a lot of uh, hiccups, uh, let's say, about that uh, last year. <laughs> All right, and um, I also have another news for you, and that is uh, that uh, leadership and sustainability, we're not only approved as an FEM verifier uh, body, but we have also been approved as an uh, SLCP uh, verifying body. So in the future, we are also uh, intending to conduct a social and labor uh, compliance program uh, verifying or FSLM if you are doing it according to the SAC program. So please contact us if you are interested uh, in uh, verifications. And then also if you are want to go back and listen to some of our previous webinars, here is a list of them. You can then, when you get the presentation, uh, you can click on those links. Uh, otherwise, you can also go to the Leadership and Sustainability to our blog, go to our website and then select the tab a blog and then you can find uh, all those webinars as well and listen to them or download the presentations. So we invite you to do the training and verification with us. You can book a time uh, with me uh, to have a conversation about your needs, but you can also contact us directly. So you see the, the links here uh, to myself to Aladdin or Okur in Turkey, but also to Hafizur Rahman in Bangladesh. So please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions. And also, if you need support um, with uh, developing, for example, improvement programs based on the HIGFM, you are most welcome to, to contact us and we would be happy to, to support you there. And now 
our final final slide here you can see our team members we are growing uh, we are right now we are hiring a senior uh, person here in germany as well and um, uh, with that i would like to thank you so much uh, for joining us there will be a survey after um, we close this window and please uh, feel free to to respond to that survey and give us input it's really always valuable to get input about what worked well in the presentation what you would like to see next time uh, what we can do better and also any other questions that you have so for now thank you so much for joining us today have a great rest of your day and goodbye bye bye